Pledge of Allegiance. And welcome. Please stand. Our Father and our most gracious God, we are so thankful for another day that we're able to serve you and to be forgiven for all of our wrongdoings and sins of omission and sins of commission. We just thank you for your forgiveness. And we pray, Lord God, that you will continue to bless each and every one of us, not only as leaders of this community, not only as our city council and administrators, but also as your citizens of this great body. We thank you for the city and the, the county of Green Cove and Clay, and we thank you for the work that you have given each and every one of us to do. We pray now that you will continue to bless each and every one of us, and strengthen us, empower us to do your work and to do your will for the good of your people. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we pray, and we say thank you and amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. So I know Ms. Janice is going to make some introductions today. I see we've actually got some of the students with us here this evening, which is nice. Um, and I think um, I'll, uh, we'll reintroduce Laura Diedenbach. And I think, was did one of the professors make it here this evening? They made it. They died. All right. Okay. All right. So we'll make sure we recognize him. Um, and I know we've got some guests here for the county. I I'm glad to see that they were able to be here. The county manager, county attorney, development services director, if I've missed Anyone else from the county? Um, oh, our sheriff is here today. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so in any event, um, at this point, and I also see the Council on Aging Director. I'm glad we extended the invitation to you as well. So um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Fleet. Um, and then the plan is to kind of go, you know, from, from the boards to the, the interactive models, if you will. Um, and then uh, basically um, one of the, the beginning points, if you will, is that we are going to talk about creating a green district, how we can increase densities. Uh, we'll talk about some of the capital improvements. And of course, we've got more work to do after this evening. This is not the end, if you will. Um, and then um, I know we had a um, letter from the uh, county back in March, as I recall. And we basically advise them that we're still going through the process, and once we have everything done, the, the time clock will begin, if you will. So I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Fleet. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And May, this is kind of exciting as a planner. This is what we all work for. Um, we, as you know, as the mayor said, oh. Jen, you need to get to a microphone. Okay. Um, we. Uh, this is kind of the culmination as we work through our our planning grant that we got last year. As you know, we the we work we work with the Center for Building Better Communities at the University of Florida, which is a combination of landscape architecture and planning students. We contract with them back in October or September, excuse me, um, and then they came up with this plan. Initially, they came with a finding necessity plan which you adopted on by resolution on April 15th. And the next part of the piece of the puzzle was the actual creation of the CRA plan. 
Now, understand you, this is a draft plan because we need input from you and the community as we move forward. But we feel that um, this is a rerun a little bit for Danielle and I. We were lucky enough to go down to the studio presentation in April where we basically have the same presentation. We thought that the students did so good and we really enjoyed hearing it and to, to give the opportunity for you to have the same kind of interactive session. Um, as you saw in your staff report, the idea is, as Danielle mentioned, we have creating the Green District as they were trying to take off our name of Green Coast Springs. Um, we, the plan you have in front of you, I, it was, as I went through it, put like sticky notes so that you saw uh, some of the recommendations that staff has as well as typos that will be corrected. Um, the areas that are the most important that we feel is section 3.3, which is, talks about the phasing, uh, which is on pages 100 to 116, and section 6, which is the phasing and prioritization, which goes from 199 to 211. And those are the projects that are going to start looking into your capital improvement plan of funding this. Um, we, staff feels that uh, we're moving forward with, the, we feel the phasing needs to be reduced a little bit, and we recommended that uh, to, to, to the students and in the plan. And we also feel that, and then we mentioned that there's some policy decisions through that the council needs to make, and, and those are why we highlighted a couple of areas that I did, and in the back there's also some recommendations for changes to a comprehensive plan and land development regulations, and particularly talking about historic preservation ordinance, adopting a complete streets program, uh, which would be good uh, things as well that we need to do. There's also some sections on marketing branding, which is very apropos when we had our discussion this morning on the budget this morning with the importance of marketing and branding our city. Um, I'm really going to turn it over to our representatives from the university because this is their work product. Um, I was very presently surprised that the whole week before we went down there, I was like nervous. I got, I got these deliverables. I got to get to the state. What if they totally bomb? They far exceeded our expectations. I mean, this is the honest truth. Um, and uh, we had, there were probably, there were 16 students that worked on the plan. Um, Fortunately, not all 16 students can be there. They have, a lot of them have internships during the summer. Um, and so we were lucky enough to get two that are here, um, as well as the two students that are here are Dave Couch, who actually lives in Fleming Island. And so he's, he took this as his project, really. He's a landscape architecture student, and he really took this personal, which was really neat. Um, and then Ken Wayra, who's a planning student, um, and he drove up, he's, are you in Gainesville summer or in Ocala? He's in Gainesville summer, so he drove up from Gainesville. And then Laura Dietenbach, who is a planner, and she is getting close to her doctor. She's a doctoral student, so I just hope you can get that. I'm excited for her. And, uh, and then Dr. Fernand Lewis, who is, was a lead, one of the lead professors on the group. And uh, I'm going to, after that, I'm going to turn it over, and do you want him to go ahead and get up? Yeah, if all the council can get up and kind of come over this way, we'd appreciate it. And anyone else um, in the audience that wants to move closer or move over towards the posters, we're just going to I want to first take the opportunity to thank the council again for this opportunity um, to have a studio. It's rare when we have a landscape architecture and planning studio and that it works out as well as it did. Um, this was such a great, I know, come closer, touch them. Um, it's, it, you can touch them. This is all about interaction. Um, and just, and thank you so much. We had, um, it was a lot of hard work, but we really had a, a blast and we're pleased with the results of this. Um, I'm just going to take the opportunity to go through the posters to explain our process um, of everything that led into the document that you all have been given, um, and then have an opportunity to explain the models behind you, um, and then open it up to your questions, and we'll do that with you answer them. Um, our first step um, was to really analyze um, the existing conditions um, of the city of Green Cove Springs, do um, in planning terms what we call a SWOT analysis, which is to analyze your strengths and weaknesses, your opportunities and threats, um, do all of our background um, data and analysis, set you in your regional context, 
um, which is really important to start to learn how Green Cove Springs is, it is interactive with the region, but also very unique and different from the region. Um, and look at all those things. And then the, the overall question um, that we had is, you know, why, why go to Green Cove Springs? Um, what draws people here? And to really take a look at that. Um, the students conducted two site analysis. Um, they came and walked all over the, the proposed CRA area and um, really took great notes and lots of photos and um, came back with great ideas. Um, more inventory and analysis was done. We started to take a look um, with your GIS data and the county's GIS data about what was actually on the ground and how much of your district is actually off the tax rolls because it's either city or county property or it's residential that falls below the taxable value. So we really needed to look at, in terms of energizing the district, what you had to look at because this is about tax income so you want to bring up that tax increment um, and making sure that development happens particularly on taxable land. That's always good. Um, we looked at the local traffic circulation and um, patterns. We looked at what it's like to be a pedestrian here, which with your state roads can be really frightening. And, um, and look at how your roads really impact your, your city. One of the things that we did, you'll see throughout the document, is we stopped calling Orange Avenue State Road 17 and we stopped calling Ferris State Road 16 because particularly within this district you need to take ownership of those roads again and make them local roads. I'm not talking about ownership, but reclaim them um, for the city and its feel um, and make them, make them feel like local streets. And um, then defining the district and how it interrelates with all of your other established districts, your historic districts, your adopted central business district, your gateway corridors, and how all of that plays together and interacts. And then um, here you can see the phasing schedule that's in your document. Um, the phasing schedule, the important thing to know about the phasing schedule is the way that we proposed it even though it's in phases. Those phases were built more on the character of the sub areas, not in the order of priority that you should take things. Um, the way that we've defined this is even though it might be um, in phase two, say with the Augusta Savage Center, that's something that because it's already underway, it's already sort of that employment and government center um, for phase three. Um, the phase two, which is um, <coughs> more of kind of the heart of um, Orange Avenue and also the MLK corridor going all the way out to Augusta Savage and, um, and then your CBD or your Walnut Street area as phase one. Um, and then for the purposes of our studio because we had 16 weeks and we would have loved to have made a detailed plan for all three phases, we really focused on phase one and that's um, the results over there that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, in order to um, give some idea about how um, we could invest in some key target areas, the students developed this catalyst plan, and that's really how we saw it, like how you could invest in certain target properties and that that might then develop some um, synergy to spark the rest of the district. So um, we took um, some of these, you can come and, and read in more detail here, but we talked about, you know, playing up the, the creek area here with a restaurant, um, having a um, kind of a, a site for a parking garage or a site for kind of a professional center. And when we talked about the parking garage in the study, we talked about the need to have that being lined on the bottom with some retail and office opportunities so that you're keeping your... Um, your streetscape going um, in addition to having the parking garage in that area and we saw that there's a real um, lack of professional office space up around the government complex that we thought that that could really be built upon. Um, taking um, and utilizing the old car lot areas here um, to provide um, additional spaces for new retail and some additional spaces for event parking and doing some shared parking um, in this area. And then out MLK, there's one particularly 
um, vacant parcel that's here by the railroad tracks that we saw might be nice for an art center that then could connect to the Augusta Savage um, Arts and Community Center um, and, and build some um, synergies there. And then moving down into the, the CBD area here and really looking at the three distinct sub-areas of the phase one, which is the the urban park area around Spring Park and the things that could be generated just using the park as a catalyst and some of the things that you already have going like the RFP for the police station. And then um, this sort of urban core area built around the City Hall and the Walnut Street area as a revitalization and a real focal point. And then the urban neighborhood going out to the historic triangle and what you could do to invest in some densities in this area while retaining the historic character um, of the area with the churches and great houses that are through there. Um, and so I would encourage you all to come and take a closer look at this because there are some really good ideas in here. Um, great, um, great ideas for catalysts. So this was our phase one master plan. Um, you can see the, the gray areas are sort of your existing buildings, and then um, the yellow is proposed infill um, of the areas. And the, the idea is, um, in these goals that we've established, is to make this area more walkable, more inviting. And that means not just having sidewalks, but having things like um, street trees and places to walk to, you know, um, restaurants and, um, and other focal points. Um, having that sort of public activity and really um, getting the street life going. Um, that we promote compact development and accessibility throughout the area. And then also have a diversity of uses. So this would continue to be a very mixed use type district. Um, that sort of um, live, work, shop, play um, kind of district where you could have um, lots of um, evening events, and weekend events, and um, lots of street life and things um, going on in the area, and a higher density um, than you currently have there right now, and then also um, some opportunities for intersection improvements at key intersections, so that not only um, are you defining the space, um, you're making visually people know that this is the, the green district and also making it more inviting and pedestrian friendly place by um, providing some street, some traffic calming um, and intersection treatments. And then finally, um, we promoted sort of a wayfinding and branding. We called this area the Green District, and we did that for a variety of reasons. One, um, it's Green Coast Springs, so what other kind of <laughs> And, um, but two, we noticed that there were a couple things going on already in your community. One is that you have a bi-local program called get, put, the, uh, yeah, put the Green in Green Coast Springs, or Keep the Green in Green Coast Springs. Um, so we wanted to play on that aspect of green, but the, the prosperity. That, and when I was here the last time, you all were being awarded your Tree City USA designation for the 25th year in a row. And um, you, you have this great connection to the river, and so it just seemed that the, the word green, um, the idea of prosperity, really um, encapsulated everything um, that we wanted this district to be. Um, so we put together um, some ideas for wayfinding throughout the Green District, and then some ways that you could brand it um, using tradition, nature, and community as sort of the, the um, focal point of the campaign. And so that, that was a really fun exercise to kind of develop that wayfinding and branding scheme. Um, so these are your posters. And we invite you to come and read them and look at them and study them in detail. And they're a great summary of the book that you have, uh, the multi-page book. <laughs> that we have your um, comments and we are reviewing those and making those changes at this time. And then um, one of the great things about this studio is that the presentation, the materials, 
um, once they're completed, will be available to you, and you will have the opportunity to order bound books um, so that you, know, you don't have to make prints, but that you'll have your own kind of um, CRA guidebook. And you can use that, give it to the planning and zoning board members, give it to the um, members of the community, but everyone will have an opportunity to order that and have that produced. And it will be a really high quality um, document for you all to keep. And then this final, um, oh, I don't want to get anybody caught up in my fire here. Doing a really good job. Anybody want to come up? Yeah, come on up. There's not enough knowledge you can't. Please, don't be shy. Y'all did it. Yeah, come on. It sounds like you might break it or something. No, you can't break it. If you do, the tape or hot glue does, does wonders. Spit, yes, string. <laughs> um, so this is, is the phase one area, and um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to um, have the students get really involved in um, the urban form. And so these are scale models of your buildings. Um, everything that's just cardboard is, is currently there. The red is something that you are free to move all those buildings around or to chuck them off the plan or do whatever you want with them, but they're to play with. They're to demonstrate infill and what can, um, what can be in terms of possibilities. So you can see we divided these areas into, this is the urban park area around your spring park and city hall. And then the urban core area, your Walnut Street area. And then the urban neighborhood area, which is really the residential area. You see the Council on Aging's new building here. Um, we have a few churches um, throughout. And then um, the, the housing form and the infill areas. So, um, and, and this was real painstaking. We, Appreciate the students put in a lot of time to making um, all these models and um, really playing around with with um, form and scale and um, and coming up with some really great. Ideas. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Ken and Dave are here to help answer any questions that you might have um, about their process and about the details of the plan. Um, when you were looking at the phasing aspect of it, was there a reason why you thought the phasing should be a longer period of time as opposed to the shorter ones that we're going to recommend? Um, I, not, not necessarily. Oh, okay. A lot of the phasing decisions that we made um, were based off of what we had to do for the class versus mm -hmm. the reality of the project. Um, so there's some some differences there versus what we did and what the city could do or should. Okay. I'll try to contribute to that if you like. Sure. Uh, as well. And Laura, oh, as always, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, can, can anybody hear me if I don't use yes. the mic? Can you hear me? Really <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so. Uh, uh, a lot of the phasing is dependent on the numbers that you'll find in that report. So, because redevelopment is always based on the increment and the growth of the increment, um, you'll see that we spent that increment like a little like a little checking account um, that grows every year, and we're we're counting on that. And I believe we estimated around one percent of growth per year. Plus, we're all also looking at other sources of income. Um, the county, for example, grants and things that would move into that. And so we spent that as it came in, as, it, as the increment grows is how we spent it. Then you're also looking at the physical realities of what's already in place, what resources are already in place, what other programs are underway, right? and then the, just the actual order in which things have to happen. And that's where we get into the design question. Um, what, what sorts of things can we do immediately? Uh, and call that a, a, a quick win, which just is a good thing to do. Uh, and then what can we look 10 years out, five years out, 10 years out, and, and 30 years, which is the traditional length for a redevelopment plan, but you all have a, you're looking at 10 years mostly in this, in this plan. I like four plans. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs>
Any consideration for taking uh, Orange Avenue and dropping it in two lanes with on street parking to slow traffic? Dave, uh, Ken? Uh, yeah, we did actually look at the option of returning um, Orange to have some on street parking with it. Uh, but we also realized that there's a need for traffic to move north and south through the city as well. So we didn't want to necessarily diminish the efficiency of what the state roads were doing, but redirect the pedestrian energy towards other streets, Palmetto um, and Walnut, back and forth. So we kind of let Orange Avenue do its thing while we focus some energy on other areas as well. And there's a DOT question. Do you want to add that, Ken? Oh, I just as well. Another factor. I just uh, we, when we were talking about it, the factor of the DOT came in. That's just a fight that we really don't want to deal with in the studio. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just as a reminder, back in 2005, we did our vision plan. That was trying to bring uh, reduce to get a beltway to get the trucks off of 17. Has been kind of a goal of the city for a while. And, um, one of the things that came to our attention during the studio kind of late is that um, at the state level, DOT has actually hired someone to implement um, DOT's rules or plans for livable streets. So they are embracing, they are recognizing what these roads do to communities and trying to um, remedy that through some of the things that we've recommended in our plan. So I think that in the future, it will be feasible to reclaim these streets so that they're, um, they don't create such a barrier for the community. You mean a barrier because it, there's so much traffic that's so hard and fast and intimidating it is. to be on the street with it? It is, it is. I was just actually walking from City Hall up to Spring Park Coffee between um, when Janice and I put the models together in the meeting. And just that brief block walk with all the trucks, that's a very hostile environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, it's rattling down the fence. You, know, you know, I think the Beltway will help with that. And then, um, yes, there, <coughs> there's, there's opportunities there. To, when you say the Beltway, that's the one that's going to be going across the Shands Bridge to take the truck traffic out okay. from the city. Can I ask you a question? Um, I, I, we just moved here two years ago by accident. <laughs> I mean, it was a long time. Three years ago, I came here and went, this is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> here. And then I should have bought a lottery ticket, but, but ended up coming here to actually find my mama home and I bought a house, so behind Clay High School, and we love that we can hear the high school, we can sit out back, and we can know the score, we can hear the plays, we hear about the fried Oreos, which I have not going to eat, I don't want to start that. But um, it was just, we bought an adorable old house that we've been putting back together. When I say we, I mean him. So, um, but our street is named 16A South. And when I've had to call 911 a couple of times, they don't know where that is. And I can't explain it. And I would love to be, I see that y'all are going to try to name these streets the names that they are instead of the highways. Is that something that we're going to hopefully take? No. no. I'm going to get out of scope here. That's uh, outside of the city limits. Uh huh. Oh, that's a step. I got a question. Okay, I have a statement to make. Yes. Good, because it's, it's um, plus my, my address is this long, it's like, and then everybody thinks I'm in an apartment because I say 16A. My chickens, we were there. So, um, but the thing that drew me to this community when I drove from Orange Park and crossed Doctors Inlet and then crossed another bridge, I was like, it's so clean. Look at all of those boats. Look at, every, where's the litter? And I well, can't remember who was in there. So, um, <laughs> because, you know, I mean, and I've lost 35 pounds since I moved here. Because it's not going to be 
ring around the down the urban core, and then the historic kind of laying the laying outside of that. So that's but not a big ring, you know, just a small a small area that's multifamily developed. All good points. Uh, we did try to include multifamily units in our plan. Um, and we discussed how to, how to mix them with some of the historic and e traditional Ebor is another good example of that. If you look at Ebor, what they did is they couched them in behind the downtown. Right. They have a lot of townhouses and row homes down there. These larger boxes were intended to be the multifamily units. So these could be three or four dwelling units per building. Um, and then we sort of played with how they interacted with the city blocks. So for these individual buildings are some of the old Victorian homes, the single families that are beautiful, want to keep and, uh, um, and build upon. So this interaction is how we sort of studied how the variety of housing units would affect the downtown core. We were trying to create what we call a critical mass. So you're right, we need to bring more people in and concentrate all the people in a good, strong area that they enjoy being in. Can I, a couple of things, can I get your name and uh, address for the record? Gerdy Candace, uh, 406 Walmart. And Mrs. Scrooby, for the record. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Scrooby, I'm the county attorney, and my address is 477 Houston Street here in the county seat. Um, Notice he said County Seniors. <laughs> I guess, right? <laughs> 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 right. Well, I, on, a on a personal note, I've worked in Grand Cove Springs now for uh, 28 years. And uh, my wife was born and raised here. And my father was a large figure here for many, many years before I ever came along. And so I have from a personal standpoint, a, a great interest in the community and seeing it thrive and uh, seeing what it can become. Um, strictly from the standpoint of you know, the county's um, cooperation, the county's uh, grant of authorization, which has to take place in a charter county, and um, you all are aware of that. Um, Though that the county does have a number of questions because it's going to be asked essentially to be a partner in financing the way this happens. And of course, if it happens uh, in, in a robust way, then everybody, everybody gains from that because the tax base is enhanced accordingly. And that's over a long haul. But of course, for the county, then it freezes uh, or it can have the effect, unless it's negotiated otherwise, it can have the effect of freezing your revenues, just like it would for the city, at least within this area. And of course, then the cost of services continues to rise. And that's always the dilemma, isn't it? That's always sort of the, um, you know, the hard problem to sort of overcome. And we've done this already once in the county, and you're probably aware of that. Green Cove, I'm sorry, Keystone Heights approached us seven, eight, nine years ago and uh, presented us with a plan. And uh, I, uh, you know, I've been down there recently and um, I don't know exactly how far along they are because it sort of happened right before the collapse. So I'm not sure what kind of revenues they've been getting. They have been getting them because every year I work on the calculation of the increment and uh, several people do to confirm it and make sure it's the right amount. Uh, to remit it in time, um, but it's not a significant amount of money at this point. And just the way we handled that was there was a concern about the increment getting so high that it might uh, really impair the county's ability to fund the services that might be needed. But of course, in Green in Keystone, we also we provide fire and rescue there. Uh, here we don't provide and police and say fire rescue and police. Here we provide fire rescue, but you have your own law enforcement. Um, but nevertheless, we had an arrangement that's an agreement that uh, put a cap on what the increment could be. And I think if I recall from memory, in that case, it was uh, a certain dollar amount, and I can't remember what it was, 100,000, 200,000, whatever it was would be the maximum increment, and above that, the 
county and the city would uh, keep the, the CRA would kick back to the county 50% of the increment above that threshold amount. But you know, we can go look at the record to see how that worked out. Um, of interest to the county as, a, as an investor you know, would be to see how you've, uh, I mean, this is one thing, but to come up with the, the revenues to make that happen, uh, my assumption is that either you have or at some point are going to undertake a fiscal analysis or an analysis of what kind of revenues would come in on the increment using reasonable assumptions, and then how you would dole those out in a phased approach like you talked about, and uh, to see then what that would do potentially to your to your values, to your to your sub your taxable values, because then that's that feeds on itself. But at the end of the day, you have a much more valuable community at the end of the period. And I think we put a cap on how long it can run. I think the statute talks about 40 years, and I think we limited it maybe to 30. But again, I'm not remembering that I'm certain as well as I like in that regard. Um, so I think the county would be interested in seeing as a as a co-investor. And I, by the way, you know, this hasn't been vetted to the county commission yet. I think they're aware of it, of course. And if uh, today I just got a chance to look at the at the big plan document, and uh, I'm going to spend more time with that uh, when I get the opportunity. But uh, I don't know how the county commission can react to this. I have not discussed it with them in detail. I've had a conversation with the chairman. Uh, which led to the letter that we've all received. But uh, beyond that, there's no indication that I can share as to exactly how the town commission would react to that. Okay. I have talked to uh, Mr. Arnold at some length about it and uh, talked to him about uh, different ways that this kind of thing can be addressed. I'm not an expert in that, but uh, uh, beyond that, not really a whole lot to report on the county's end. So, whether the county commission is going to go along with this, I don't know. But in order to give them as much information as can be had so that they, as co-investors, can sort of see how this would play out, that would be what I would encourage you to do, is to provide information that sort of matches anticipated revenues, increment revenues, uh, shows an inflow of that over a period of years. And I, I would do it annually to the extent that you can, I think, with the spreadsheet. And that's not my domain, but with a spreadsheet, you might be able to project those revenues. Uh, and then put a kicker in for the increase in value that begins to flow from these efforts. Uh, and then show how the money could get spent out in tree uh, scaping and, and uh, managing your signs and your, uh, your vertical sort of development and your sidewalk improvements. And, and list those things out understanding that that's <coughs> going to be tentative, okay? Uh, and I think, uh, and I can't speak again for the county on this, but some thought might be given to how you would, uh, uh, how you would people your community redevelopment agency, who would be sitting there helping make those decisions? Uh, and, you know, would you give some thought to including your co-investor and the opportunity to participate in that. Again, I, I don't know whether that would appeal to them or not. It's just a, a thought that kind of would kick away as an idea. Um, so that, is that something that we would expect to see in the near future within this narrow window? That, we have a time frame to react in, and everybody knows that too, but within just what this one more second. That, you have an attorney microphone. Oh my God. Okay, but um, we've got a, we've got a time frame that we've got to react to as well, um, because there's sort of a default provision in the statute that if we fail to respond, then uh, we have all the full authorization. In uh, Keystone, I remember, I'm pretty sure that in the agreement we. Uh, precluded their ability to issue bonds using the increment revenue, and I'm, I'm sure that's negotiable. I don't know whether that's on the table here, whether you have to use it uh, through a financing to, to make that happen. Another thing we did was we uh, uh, did not empower them to exercise the power of eminent domain, 
And uh, again, that was a concern that the county commission at that time had about uh, uh, you know property owners in the area maybe suffering losses that they didn't really anticipate, but uh, maybe for the greater good that, that they would object to. So I'll turn it back over. But those are kinds of my Stephanie. Did I cover the basis for kind of issues that you would like to see? I, I can tell you this, his daddy wasn't near that verbose, and I knew him well. That's a long time to allow an attorney to help. Do I agree with myself? Can I get something on the floor here? All right. Uh, I'm going I'm be, to be quick about two points. One, I'm going to address Mark's uh, thoughts on that. One of, the, one of the neat things is, and I've expressed this to the county manager on several occasions, uh, as far as funding and county dollars, you know, in uh, I'll just put it out there. Uh, with my county dollars, uh, which I pay the majority of my taxes to the county, uh, they go to the different parks. They go, I have a little bit of stake in every road that's done out there because of that. Somebody that lives outside of the county doesn't have the same for here. Uh, they come into the city and enjoy the spring park and whatever. And the reality is, is that none of those dollars at this point in time do that. So I look at this as an opportunity for everybody taking some of our dollars back uh, that would have otherwise gone as an opportunity for everybody to invest and, uh, and be a part of it because it is the county seat. We do have some wonderful areas that everybody enjoys, whether it be a Spring Park, or Augusta Savage, or any of the other many places we've got. The second thing I want to address is, uh, is the fact that, uh, and we mentioned it today early, we may want to look at here, there is a site for about 82 uh, townhomes, uh, the old pyramid building, uh, where we've cleared that off, it's owned by a developer, uh, they've done a couple different master plans. One's with, one was with condominiums, one was with townhomes. It's set there now with townhomes. And it may be something that if, uh, again, uh, having been somebody that tried very hard to put a mixed-use project in on, uh, on Orange Avenue uh, 10 years ago before the, the, the crash, uh, and I call it a crash, uh, that, that kind of thing sometimes needs a little bit of help. So you may want to take a look at that and incorporate one more block over uh, to that large empty area. That is set up now, I think it's even zoned for, uh, for multifamily and could be a high end, I mean, a, you know, a very, very nice uh, residential add to the mix of mix of as well. I was gonna say that, that, that I know some of the agents are working on that and that is the, that's the plan. And I'm wondering, um, I'm not talking too much out of turn, stop me, but, um, the places where I've seen some signs up for sale, and it's a piece of land, um, you know, over in here, and there's beautiful trees. And are are y'all going to be saying, we really rather you not go in there and clear cut the whole place and just start throwing up these big mansion at condominium things that are more first big win? I don't know. Tacky. We don't want tacky. We don't want to be have a tacky town. The, what's up going over there is not going to be tacky <coughs> more on the end. It's going to put gazillion in it. And they will, but the thing that is, is they are, their intention is <coughs> to continue to find little spots to nibble and nibble and nibble. And a town like this can be death by duck bites by the time they through, through with that, if, unless everyone has a resolve to keep someone who comes from Louisiana where everybody's in everybody's pocket and everybody's bumbo. But, um, and related to one another, so if nothing ever happens, I would hope that doesn't happen. Let, I, just, I just wanted to kind of go over the process where we are from here so that council and everybody understand that we got a grant from the state to do this funding assessment CRA plan. We, we um, basically sub, sub, did a sub consultant agreement to engage the University of Florida Center for Building Good, Building Better Communities. Then this is the plan they have completed their exercises. What we do now as we move forward is going to be basically on a, you know. So they did the plan, which is they did a you know, great job and a lot of time and effort goes. And now how we move forward when we start getting into the, and that's why we put draft all over it because it is a draft plan. I mean, we can, they're going to get it to us. And it's a plan, but there is certain adoption, there's noticing, you know, like the, the county attorney talk, all the financing, all that stuff is what, and timing 
for the council is really good, as, as Ms. Judd said this morning, because as you go through your budgeting process, this funding, um, moving forward with this is how you're going to fund it. And like even on the CIP, if you want to adopt this, as you move forward with CRA, CRA, you cannot put anything in your normal CIP that you want to fund in your CRA for three years. So we have some issues we, you know, we've talked about within staff. So just so you know that that's where we're moving forward. This was them to present their plan, make sure they meet it, and get some input from the council of what, um, you know, we're moving forward, and then it's going to basically come back to staff and, and the council. Input from the council. Exactly. Um, and we can ask. I just wanted to piggyback on what Dan said about the county. Um, Ms. Kapalusis and Mr. Scrooby, one of the things that, that I wanted to point out that we talked about today is the money that we've invested in up here and how it's one of the only places where you can like bring a sizable boat and spend the night and have electric and water and enjoy the beautiful river in our park. And those are the kind of things that we would really like for the, the county to, to realize that, that everybody in the county has access to, that, that we fund them. And so those are some of the things that are our concerns. Mr. Page, and then we're going to About page 1862, uh, Colonial Drive, Green Coast Springs, Florida. Just sort of three questions here. One. As you were looking through this plan, was there any consideration for bed and breakfast, which sort of addresses why to come to Green Coat Springs and all of those things? And just as a refresher to council memory, uh, about 10 years ago, nine years ago, we looked at doing some zoning changes that would have allowed four or five properties in the area to do that. It kind of got sidetracked and sit somewhere, but um, you know, it seems like a logical outgrowth of that. The other is any discussion, which I that I can't remember right now which one of the West Coast Florida is over, uh, cities in Florida, but they have a local, uh, I'm going to say electric bus golf cart kind of deal that they're using for sort of downtown trolley loop kind of thing, which uh, I think in Green Coast Springs fits with your green pattern and might also be a nice link into Magnolia Point in that you could run it into the uh, Magnolia Park there. People can now park their golf carts hop on the electric trolley, come downtown. Again, a way to get people to come downtown with that. And the other thought process, and it, Mr. Royal made the suggestion that maybe you want to expand the area to cover uh, Magnolia Cove down here. But I might just suggest to you as you go down, I guess that would be Center Street, you may want to expand the area out to cover the, uh, the sheriff's maintenance garage, a number of those things, which if you look over the time frame of 20 to 40 years, uh, there are going to be governmental changes in how you use those facilities and what you do with them, and they might be very nice facilities to have in your CRA if you have to refurb and recondition those spaces. So, just my thoughts. Are there any pressing questions before we take our seats? Um, Madam Mayor, I just wanted to point out two things, and I know Drew has been very quiet, but one of the things with regards to increasing the density um, is that um, you've already approached the city about doing some affordable senior housing. So I, you know, I kind of heard around the loops, but I haven't heard that. I think that's important to know that the Council of Aging is thinking on that on that line. That's why we asked them here today. Also, I think if anyone's going to be the transportation loop or whatever, um, you all have kind of taken on that transportation hat right now. And for those of you that don't know, they have the green line and the red line and <laughs> okay, <laughs> color coded. And basically, they're getting dollars from DOT on, on what I call demonstration grants. And I, I came from a community, in fact, uh, one of our buses actually came to you, sheer coincidence, it followed me here or actually got <coughs> before me a month or so. So, in any event, I say that to say this I think that we. You know, we have um, a partner, also another partner here in the Council on Aging that I think can help with some of those areas. And I think it's really key with regards to the services that you provide and the walkability items as well. Thank you. You know, one thing I wanted to mention, the county might not like me to say this, but one of the things that, that I noticed that the CRA doesn't include where the beltway is across the 16 specifically. And that probably should be included because if you're talking about TIF that's generating revenue, that area at that intersection is going to 
value up quicker than some other areas around it and could contribute to the TIF. So expanding the area to include that intersection might be a, something you might want to think about. Um, the one other thing I would add, and we haven't talked about it, as I recall, in the uh, draft plan document, there was a dialogue about State Road 16, as I recall, right, about capturing it for, I think the cross street was Green Street, as I recall, and we haven't talked about that, but I did want to throw that out, that there was a, a dialogue in the plan about picking it up around the Green Street area and um, you know, figuring out how to divert traffic to capture it there as opposed to everybody de dead ending now, which is what we do at the intersection of 17 and 16. So that was another important point, I think, on State Road 16. So and they all had a, a, um, a boutique hotel, the idea of a boutique hotel. want to have a seat at the table as part of that, you know, policy-making board. 
Um, I, I haven't seen that model. I have seen it where the city council is a CRA. Never went. Now remember, when you do that, you actually adjourn and you reconvene yourself as this governing body. Or I've seen it where a group of citizens is the CRA. But I, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that the CRA is not some third, you know, third party. You don't, you don't, you know, you don't run for office or anything like that. So. Um, and then the, you know, just to expand on what the county attorney has indicated, because like I said, I've worked with several CRAs, it's that increment, that increase in values, do you know what I'm saying, that you reinvest in the boundaries. So the two guiding policy documents that are critical is the boundaries, and we, we've heard, you know, potentially some tweaks in that today, and what projects, and um, also as the county attorney has indicated, what is it that you want to see happen in that area? And you can use it for things other than just simply um, capital. You know what I'm saying? There are certain restrictions, and it's all governed by statute. But, but the key thing, the easiest thing for the public to understand is whatever that increment that comes in, it is restricted for use within that boundary. And I know we've had a lot of discussion on that. So, and I think that's kind of what the, the county attorneys indicated. So. Right. And, and you'll be restricted within your plan. Yes. Plan would dictate what you're going to do with it, but so if if in the base year, whatever this, let's say the assessed value is 100 million dollars, I don't know what it is, but say it's 100 million dollars. If it goes up in the following year, it's 101 million dollars, and, and that's one million dollar increase in the taxable value, and our millage is eight mills, let's say, then you would realize that the CRA trust fund would realize an eight thousand dollar inflow from that. Now we would still get our eight mills on $100 million, the county would continue to receive the revenue from that. That would be looking at But it's that $1 million extra, that $8,000. So the scale of it, it depends on, uh, on just exactly how big a uh, jump in value you get. Yeah, I guess that was my point. The $1 million is the only thing you're going to get. So, so everybody wants to do everything now, and if you're only getting the incremental growth of it, then it's going to be a, a slow process, in my opinion. Right. Before you can do this, and that's why it's the uh, 20, you know, your your term. That, that's why I suggest you get a, a, some kind of a spreadsheet that shows the flow funds. Sure. But remember, it's the it's the it's the one million increment in the example that the county attorney gave. Sure. But but it's a it's a factor of what you levy on that millage in terms of what comes in as the as the operating revenue, if you will. You follow what I'm saying? And I think we're capped against your millage, are we not? Is that right? So if you levy 2.7, is that not right, Janice? I can't remember. Yeah, so you, you get 2.7. Yeah. The city's village. The city's village, which is the city's for you, just for a number's sake. The city's village would also flow into the trust funds for that million dollars of increased value. The the city would still get its three mills on the hundred million dollars value for its general operating purposes. But the three thousand dollars that would come in off that million dollar increase in value would go into the CRA trust fund for the same purposes. And I can't remember whether the, the is the county's not capped by the city's village. Uh, I don't we remember, but I don't think we have any dependent taxing districts. If that's what you're asking. No, no, about. that's not what I'm asking. Limiting the uh, their mill in essence, their mill would be the same as ours. What are you saying for the purpose? Yeah, I don't know about the answer to that, but let's let's just say for just the sake of discussion, that's the scale of revenues that you see coming in, assuming a hundred million dollars of value and maybe first year of a million dollar increase. Right. No, I mean you are right in terms. Now, I mean, you are right in terms of the cap that it, it wouldn't be eight mills because we're not levying eight mills. I think it's what. But we are. I, I understand, but but we uh, aren't. And as I recall, there's a. What? I thought there was a statute change about that. Or seven, where sorry. Where the, there has to be the same. Yeah, no, we're not <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sorry, I'm like breaking out in the sweat back here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I, was, and I would like to maintain a student order, so we're going to have the vice mayor and Mr. Timberlake. One of, the, uh, one of the neat things about this whole plan, though, is the fact that it, it takes the, the, the core of Green Coast Springs, and if it improves it like we hope to believe in as a plan. Not only will these go up, but the values of my home at Magnolia Point and the values <laughs> all around the surrounding areas are going to go up because people are going to want to be here. So it's not it's not that one little pot that, that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the values that of, of all the property in Green Coast Springs if we're successful over a period of time. So 
I think there's, uh, there's it's a, it's a, it is, as we pointed out, an investment opportunity for, for all of us, because we're all, all of us that are tax, taxpayers are going to invest in it, and uh, an opportunity for uh, the county to give us a little bit more money. <laughs> Mr. Timberlake. Mr. Gloria is uh, on target, and, and I was going to say, first off, Laura, thank you to you and, and the group that worked with you. I uh, think you've done a fine job. Um, and, and I would hope that, I would expect that we would put together some sort of cash flow analysis so that we can see what the anticipated revenues are. I was going to make the same point that Councilmember Royal did, that I would also expect that cash flow to project <coughs> an impact on every other piece of property in Green Coast Springs because that would be a direct benefit to the county at full value, not the incremental cap. So I think we have to look at both sides of that equation. Um, and, and our goal is if this is a win-win, I hate to use that term, but it's a win-win that everybody benefits from this. And obviously, if we're successful, or when we're successful with the CRA, um, and the core part of the city improves, that improves Magnolia Point, that improves the attraction, there's new home developments, the multi-use um, property that, that Councilman World was talking about will sell much more rapidly, which obviously has been brought revenue in the county. So I would see us as partners in that regard. Um, and as we say, we have a tremendous amount of our tax revenue that goes to the county, and there's very little that comes back from the county to us. So we, we want to factor all those things into a cash. Um, we have less than uh, 15 minutes, but I was going to ask the council if in any of these tasks that I'm about to mention, if you have anything specific that you would like to say. Um, we've discussed the boundary. Um, and you if we, get pages? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, sir, I sure can. Um, if you'll turn to page 60, and it talks about art and culture. Do you have any comments? And if you don't, go we'll move further. Yeah. Do we need to address the boundaries? Is that what you mean? Well, we kind of discussed it. Okay. If you want to go back, no, 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 we can totally definitely. That, we need to, do you all want, would like to have more discussion? Actually, we need to, as a council, express our opinion on what the boundaries should be. Okay. Then we need to determine, does that substantially change the finding of necessity? Well, and yes, what sir. impact does that have? And that may, that may dictate our decision. Mr. Royal made uh, uh, a very good observation earlier regarding this question. Well, I, I, I like the way the council was set up. And obviously, Laura and I have just been talking for a little bit, but it, since we've already adopted the finding necessity report, if we go back, we have to readopt the finding necessity. We have to reanalyze everything because the everything was based on the tax values, the crime statistics, all that was based on the boundaries that the council set out back in, I think, November is when they came up with the original boundaries. That's, you know, um, but, and so you're, we advertise, all that stuff would have to, we'd be back to where we were back a couple of months ago instead of moving forward. So, uh, Madam Mayor, I wouldn't necessarily want to close the door on that. I, I think the, the one area, uh, pyramid, you know what I'm saying, it's very um, compact. Um, I'm not sure about the other areas that I heard they might be more involved, but, um, let us take a look at that. I'm not sure we could go as far out as I think uh, Mr. Drew's, Drew's question on State Road 16. I think that's. I, I, I misspoke. I meant set, we're 17. I was going to say, I'm trying to visualize cross. that, and that's way, way south. I, I meant we're 17. And, and yeah, I think that would be cross. some point south of Reynolds, and I would not suggest that you probably go that far out with the CRA, but we can certainly follow up afterwards with, with Drew. Um, but anyway, why don't you give us the flexibility, you know what I'm saying, to make that determination? Okay. Sure. I'd like to uh, say one thing, uh, Madam Mayor, if I might. The default provision that Martin was talking about was once we give them the information, they have 70 days, I'm going to say it. 120, 120, yeah, yeah. But we're, we're, I know the city council, and we're not about to try to take advantage of the county in any way like that, any more than y'all would of us. And I've already told that to Mark, I've already put that in writing. And so, uh, suffice to say that, you know, it, it's got to be a cooperative venture, and that's that's what I'm here, and I just wanted to say that. Was there, am I hearing any further discussion on that? Or are you satisfied with what we have? Council, are, are we going to get into things like the branding? We would love to. Of that, we or would, would that be a future discussion? Well, it may end up being a future discussion because we are looking at us in 15 minutes. I, I would make a recommendation. So, 
I would make a recommendation that uh, the, the city manager as well as the staff and, and Laura and the, the, the whole team uh, look at the possibility of, of expanding. If it, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then I understand. If it, if it can be expanded and we think it's a, it's a good expansion, then you have my full support to do that. And I would recommend that. Hey, great. That's a motion. Yeah. All right, and there's a second. We have a motion and a second for the discussion. Hearing none, roll call, please. Council Member Rowland? Yes. Council Member Lewis? Yes. Council Member Timberlake? Yes. Vice Mayor Royal? Yes. Mr. Mayor Hampshire? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Okay. And then, with that motion, we believe that this is going to be good. We've got to get that. Um, Madam Mayor, if we're going to go through, Various components of the if they have to be decided tonight, I think it would warrant some discussion on the branding aspect. And, okay. and I only say that, that I say that from the standpoint that we've already got a little bit of investment in the concept of code blood. Yes. Um, that that's something that we could expand that. That's on page 84. Okay. You're welcome. We could expand code blood <coughs> to incorporate something around the brand that right. people wanted to. But I, I would hate to see us walk away from something that's already kind of synonymous with them. I'll come down there. It wasn't our intent tonight to, you know, I'm saying have all those policy decisions done. Okay. I mean, this is oh, like, this is the first pass for the council, the first pass for the community and, and our partners as well. I think, you know, the main thing was to get the information out there to see the, the models, the visuals, the representation, and then, you know, saying we can we can come back because we're, we're going to need to come back because the uh, CIP issues, you know what I'm saying, are going to drive the, the cash flow analysis and everything else that we need to do. And then we can determine whether or not, uh, prior to when we come back again, um, looking at the boundaries, you know what I'm saying, for that one area will work or not. So that would be my recommendation. I, I don't want this, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know what I'm saying, yes. tonight Tonight is the date. The only reason why I'm recommending that we look at the boundaries is, you know, having been at the tail end of a CRA and know what it can do, it's real critical, you know, if there's one other thing we need to let, take a look on the boundaries, then, you know, I think it's worth spending a few extra months, if that makes any sense. I'm not talking about stopping the process, but let's take a look at the boundaries. So. I appreciate that because I really couldn't see us, you know, having the opportunity to really going to an in-depth discussion about this, but you have a motion. I will. So with that, I'll make a motion that we um, provide the additional input regarding the boundaries to staff to go ahead and proceed with looking at that and for them to take the next step to produce mm -hmm. the final CRA for the um, for transmittals attacking the authority mm -hmm. future council discussion. That's good. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Frawley? Yes. Councilmember Lewis? Yes. Councilmember Timberlake? Yes. Vice Mayor Royal? Yes. Mayor Hampshire? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And please allow me to uh, take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. And um, we hope that you will stay involved in this process. Um, I can see our future looking up here in the Green District, so to speak. And um, thank you, and I hope to see you back again soon this week. Thank you, guys. Thank you.